Hello, my name is Troy Eller English and I am the archivist for the Society of Women Engineers. SWE keeps its archives, and me, here at the Walter P. Ruther Library of Labor and Urban Affairs at Wayne State University in beautiful Midtown Detroit. I'm going to take you on a tour of the Ruther Library today and show you some of the amazing things in SWE's archives. But the Ruther Library is so large and SWE's archives are so interesting that we couldn't possibly fit it all into one video. So be sure to watch part two when this one is over. You may be wondering how SWE's archives ended up here in Detroit at a library and archive devoted to documenting the history of the American labor movement, Wayne State University and Metropolitan Detroit. Let's find out. We, as we know it today, was founded 70 years ago, in 1950, when several different organizations on the East Coast, each calling themselves the Society of Women Engineers, came together as a unified organization. Over the next several years, the founders underwent the hard work of establishing the society, and in doing so, they created a lot of paperwork. Meeting Minutes Bylaws Incorporation Documents Letters Reports Publications Telegrams Photographs Drawings Newspaper clippings And so much more. And SWE's founding members were really careful about saving all of this paper, documenting SWE's history as they were making it. And that's what archives are, a collection of primary sources, historical documents and records, that tell us about a place, an institution, people, or an event. To deal with all this paper, SWE formed an Archives Committee in 1953. For the next several decades, the Archives Committee and leaders worked on gathering and organizing important papers from SWE leaders, committees, and volunteers. It wasn't always easy. Here's a funny letter written by SWE's 1958 recording secretary, and soon-to-be vice president, Virginia Tucker, trying to round up board minutes and committee reports for the Archives Committee. She wrote, I have a feeling that Esther Williams may have it in her box, which is apparently a catch-all. She has told me, as well as others, that I spend too much time on organization. It's quite evident she doesn't believe in it at all. You probably know Virginia Tucker's legacy, even if you don't know her name. She is best known for establishing, recruiting, and supervising the pool of more than 400 female computers at Langley Research Center from 1935 to 1946. After she left, Langley established West Area Computing, a segregated pool of black female computers that was made famous several years ago in the book and movie Hidden Figures. She's mentioned in the book. Because of the Archives Committee's early industriousness in collecting and saving those records for decades, we have a rich collection of records today that explains how SWE survived in its formative years and why it has thrived since. But SWE faced a problem by the early 1990s. 
filing cabinets of archived documents were taking up lots of floor space. Its headquarters was moving to a new location in New York City, and space in Manhattan was at a premium. Additionally, Sui's archives were a bit of a hidden secret. Not too many people outside of Sui knew that they existed or how to access them, and Sui could sense that reporters, historians, and other people would really like to know about the society's history. That is why Sui decided to place its archival records in an archival repository. It looked at several different libraries and archives to house its records, but ultimately decided to place them here at the Ruther Library. The Sui Detroit section records were already here, and at that time, in the early 1990s, the Ruther Library also had a new building addition and lots of empty shelves to accommodate all those boxes. Sui started shipping its historic records to the Ruther in 1993, and they're still arriving today. In 2001, a master's in history student working here at the Ruther, Lauren Cada, began processing or organizing Sui's collection for a semester. But she soon became Sui's first dedicated archivist and traveled around the country conducting oral history interviews with Sui's pioneering members. Building on Lauren's work, Deborah Rice became Swee's archivist in the mid-2000s, and in 2008, I took over as Swee's dedicated archivist at the Ruther Library. There are about 75,000 linear feet of boxes here at the Ruther Library. If you line them up end-to-end, -end, they would stretch more than 14 miles. We also have another several thousand boxes in an off-site storage facility. Of the 75,000 linear feet of boxes in this building, roughly 350 of them are from SWE. So what's in the other 74,000 linear feet of boxes here? Well, the Ruther is the home of the Wayne State University Archives which were founded in 1958 by history professor Dr. Philip Mason. Two years later, in 1960, he founded the Archives of Labor and Urban Affairs. This building, the Ruther Library, opened in 1975, funded in large part by the United Automobile Workers. We are, in fact, the largest labor archive in the United States and the official archival repository for the records of the Airline Pilots Association, the American Federation of Teachers, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, the Coalition of Labor Union Women, the International Workers of the World, the Service Employees International Union, the United Automobile Workers, and the United Farm Workers, among others. And everyone here at the Ruther was very excited several years ago when we were an answer on Jeopardy. But that's not all the staff here does. We also collect records documenting civil rights, women's rights, social services, civic organizations, and philanthropy in metropolitan Detroit, including the historic records of the NAACP Detroit branch, the Civil Rights Congress of Michigan, Focus Hope, the Detroit Commission on Community Relations, New Detroit, Inc., the Jewish Community Archives, the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, United Community Services, the Southeastern Michigan Council of Governments, several Detroit-area hospitals, and many, many others. And we also collect the personal papers of people involved in these organizations and movements, including labor leaders like Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, Albert Schenker, Walter P. Ruther, and Leonard Woodcock, who, in addition to being a president of the UAW, was also appointed by President Richard Nixon to be the United States' first ambassador to the People's Republic of China. Beyond labor, we have the records of Detroit Mayors Jerome Cavanaugh and Coleman A. Young, Judge Damon Keith, businessman and philanthropist Max Fisher, 
folk singer Utah Phillips, and feminist activist Grace Lee Boggs, among so many others. So how does Swee's archives fit in with all these other collections? From the Ruther's perspective, women's rights, including the right of women to work in the career of their choice, are civil rights. And besides, we have a particular affinity for documenting the history of working women here at the Ruther, since Detroit was the birthplace of Rosie the Riveter. In fact, in her article published in the 60th anniversary issue of the Journal of the Society of Women Engineers in 2011, historian Dr. Betsy Hampshire likened the archives to priceless treasures, explaining that they, quote, hold a bounty of knowledge and information that tells stories of people, places, events, and ideas. Some of these stories locate SWE and its members within the scope of the organization and its evolution. Others locate SWE within a much broader context of national ideas and events. End quote. So, the Ruther is delighted to care for and share SWE's history. The materials in SWE's archives come from many places. I get boxes and envelopes from headquarters staff and from SWE members. Occasionally, the family and friends of SWE members send me things for the archives, too, like this 8mm silent film reel of SWE's founding meeting at Camp Green. It was filmed by Morty Gurla, who was the husband of Miriam Gurla, or Mickey, who was a founding member of the Society and SWE's fifth president. Mickey's daughter, Lisa, digitized the film and donated it to Swee's archives. And it's hard to explain just how excited I was when I saw it. Archivists don't necessarily keep everything that's sent to the archives. Keeping everything, regardless of its long-term informational or historical value, is hoarding. And we just don't have the shelf space anymore to accommodate hoarding. Instead, I have to carefully consider what documents are necessary to keep for legal reasons, what documents help SWE understand and learn from its past decisions, what things are historically significant, and what things are just cool. And, of course, SWE doesn't just send me paper. Headquarters, SWE leaders, and members send me digital files through email and cloud servers, They send me USB drives, CD-ROMs, and floppy disks. Those files ultimately are saved on our servers on the third floor, which are also mirrored on servers located off-site. We have some wonderful artwork throughout the building. You'll see this huge 20 by 9 foot mural in our reading room, which is where researchers come to look at our archival collections in person. The mural was commissioned by UAW Local 174 and was painted by WPA Federal Arts Project artist Walter Speck and Barbara Wilson in 1937. After hanging for many decades in union halls, it was coated in nicotine, had a few tears, and at some point the edges were folded under so that it could fit on a smaller wall. It was donated to the Ruther in 2015, and with a combination of donations and grants, we hired a professional conservator to clean and repair it. Just outside the reading room is this I Am a Man poster. This protest sign comes from AFSME's 1968 Memphis sanitation strike in Tennessee. The union was striking for better pay and safer working conditions after two African-American garbage collectors were crushed and killed by malfunctioning equipment on a garbage truck. But beyond that, the workers called to be treated with respect and dignity, as evinced in this protest sign. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came to Memphis to march in solidarity with these workers, and it was there that he was assassinated. Only 50 of these signs were printed. We have two of them here at the Ruther. We also have the photograph collection from Richard Copley, who was a photography student hired by AFSME to document the strike and, ultimately, King's funeral. 
It was Copley's first professional photography assignment. Some of the most engaging things in any archives collection are the audiovisual materials. The Ruther's AV materials take up half of its third floor. There are millions of photographs and negatives, and audio and visual media of all kinds. Some of the AV materials stored here came with paper collections. But we also have individual photography collections, like more than 80 linear feet of photo prints, negatives, and color transparencies from Pulitzer Prize-winning photographer Tony Spina, who, as chief photographer for the Detroit Free Press, traveled the world documenting some of the most prominent persons and events of the mid to late 20th century. Even if you haven't been to the Ruther, you might have encountered some of our archival collections, especially our photos and film, in books and in museums around the world. On the screen, our archives have been featured in movies like 2013 Oscar-winning documentary Searching for Sugar Man, in Ken Burns documentaries, and in shows on A&E, The Discovery Channel, ESPN, HBO, History Channel, Netflix, PBS, Smithsonian Channel, and all the major American news networks. Our collections have been featured in recent podcasts like Crime Town Season 2 and Dolly Pardon's America. And you'll even spot reproductions of materials in our collections in the accessories for American Girl's civil rights era doll, Melody. Swee's audiovisual collection includes photographs, negatives, slides, CDs and DVDs, digital Hi8 tapes, VH, Betamax, and Umatic tapes, and Swee even has a few really fun magnetic audio reels. Earlier this year, in two episodes of Swee Stories Tales from the Archives, on Swee's diverse podcast, we shared speeches from an entertaining panel of past Swee Achievement Award recipients, recorded at the 1968 National Convention including, among others, SWE's first president, Beatrice Hicks, and computer programming pioneer, Grace Murray Hopper, who was hilarious. And here's a great audio reel from the 1957 National Convention, featuring a speech by industrial engineering pioneer and SWE's first honorary member, Lillian Moeller Gilbreth. In this clip, she's remembering a conversation about an article written by a man giving career advice to working women. And it ended up with a very clever little statement. And it said, my advice to women is to remember that you are expected to look like a girl, to think like a man, to act like a lady, and to work like a dog. Well, uh... That didn't stop me. I said to her, I could also say that a great many people feel that a man should uh, look like a boy, think like a philosopher, uh, act like a gentleman, and work like a fiend. I said, that seems to me that not quite so good, but good enough. Well, she said, you did think it was a clever article, didn't you? And I said, well, you'd have to define clever. The Ruther has to keep an equipment morgue to play and sometimes digitize these audiovisual materials. And our AV archivists are always on the hunt for more machines, even broken ones, so that they can scrap them for parts. Many of the old audio and video reels are made from acetate, so we keep those in this large and cold walk-in refrigerator to slow their deterioration. These acetate reels are an improvement over our nitrate film, which we had to get rid of because it was prone to spontaneous combustion. We keep the really, really fragile stuff in a freezer. I hope you're enjoying this tour of the Ruther Library and Swee's archives. I'll share more of the cool things in Swee's collection in part two, like some artifacts that have been to space, some jaw-dropping newspaper headlines, 
and evidence of Swee's stand against racial segregation in the 1950s. I'll also explain how Swee's archives are used by the society and by scholars. So grab a snack, refresh your drink, and be sure to click over to part two. Thank you.